Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part six of my linear algebra tutorial series. In this part of the tutorial, we're going to cover a lot of things. I'm going to talk about unit vectors, standard basis vectors, linear combinations, spans, and a couple other topics. And I have a lot to do, so let's get into it. Okay, so I briefly brought up unit vectors previously. And basically, a unit vector is just a vector with a length of one and a direction. And it is common to designate them if you have a vector A to represent a unit vector with a hat. And they are often going to be used when we only care about direction. So to calculate one, let's say we have a vector A and it is in the form of 3, 4. Well, what we would do is we would get the magnitude of this vector to find the unit vector, which is going to be equal to the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is going to be 9 and 16, which of course gives us 25 and 5. So we know the magnitude of this vector, 3, 4, is going to be 5. Well then, to find our unit vector, what we would simply do is go and get said value and divide it by 5, exactly like this. Alright, so this is just a recap uh, that I wanted to cover just so that you could remember what unit vectors were if you forgot them. Now, standard basis vectors are unit vectors that can be used to express any other vector. So on a 2D plane, they would be represented by, and there's a couple different ways to represent them. You could say EX would be equal to 1 and 0, and EY could be represented with 0 and 1. I think you can see one is clearly an X coordinate while the other is a Y coordinate. And this is going to be used for a 2D plane. A 3D plane is going to have all of the above, but it also, in addition, is going to have E, Z equal to, and in this situation it will be 0, 0, and 1. And there would be the other two vectors as well on a 3D plane. And simply, the way you would use a basis vector is let's say we have a vector a and it is 3 and 4. Well, using basis vectors, you could also represent this by saying 3 e x plus 4 e y. And I'm sure you can figure out what to do with the th third plane as well. You're also going to see them in the form of E1 and E2. They're sometimes represented with the letters I, J, and K, and also X, Y, and Z. And that brings us to the concept of linear combination. And a linear combination is just the sum of scaled vectors. So they can be represented in this way. Let's say we have our vector here. We could also represent it with 3 and our vector in this form, which, of course, what I'm using here is a standard basis vector. So I'm just showing you, basically, that you can represent the same information in multiple different ways. And a linear combination could also be these scaled non-basis vectors. So we could have the vector a, 2, x, plus 3, y. Okay? And there is a basic concept of linear combination. Of course, much more is coming. And that brings us to sometimes the confusing concept of span. Now, R, as we have it right here, as I often draw it, like this, and as I have talked about previously, represents all real numbers. R2 is going to represent 
all real numbers in a t 2D coordinate space. And then if we take all possible values for R2, we will have the span of R2. So the main idea of defining a span is that you're defining symbols you can use to represent any vector in a coordinate plane. And if you would say something like all real numbers squared, span, EX, and EY, this is going to mean if we get all linear combinations using EX and EY, we will get all real numbers. And of course, we could have the same thing on a 3D plane by adding in EZ. And we are also going to define, and I'm going to show an example after this to really reinforce this concept. We can also define that coordinate planes have rules that to lie in them, we must have two linearly independent vectors for R2, and we must have three linearly independent vectors to lie inside of R3. And by linearly independent, all we are saying is that a vector that points in a different direction from the other vectors that we are referencing kind of might be confusing, so why don't I just jump in here and show you some examples to clear it up. Okay, so there may be a question of why two independent vectors on a 2D plane. I'm going to explain it to you very easily. Okay, so let's say we have our vector here, A, and it is equal to 2 and 3. And let's come in here and let's draw it in. So this is going to be 2 and 3. So here is our point, and here is our vector. Now we can only manipulate it by scaling with a constant, which is going to result in going in exactly the same direction. So no matter what we do, we're going to end up going in precisely the same direction whenever we are simply scaling it. And we are only going to be able to reference vectors on this specific line. And likewise, if we had like a vector B, equal to 4 and 6 provided as our second vector. You can see that it is indeed not independent because it lies on that same line. If, however, I had B and it was 5 and 2, have our point right there, our terminus area, and if I drew in this vector, you can see that it is indeed linearly independent from the other vector. And this, if these two vectors right here were provided, that would be enough for us to map out any other space on our coordinate plane. Now there's a way to check for independence. What we're basically going to do is we're going to have a constant, and we can use two and three in this situation, and Another constant, which represents 5 and 2. And we can check at the 0, 0. This is going to be translated, of course, into C1 plus 5, C2, equal to 0. 3, C1 plus 2, C2, equal to 0. And we can solve this. And guess what we are going to solve it for, or how we're going to solve it. And zero, and zero. We're going to use just a basic system of equation. And we will bring it into reduced row echelon form. And if we do, we're going to end up getting a result of one, zero, zero, one, with zero and zero as those two points. And you can see indeed that they do cross at that zero, zero point. And if we get a result like this, we can say that this is independent. Now let's go and use the other vector that we were talking about previously. So we have our A vector, and let's say we go and test for independence with a different version of B. So we'll do four and six to show you an example of what you can expect whenever you have dependent variables. So how are we going to solve this? So again, I'm using 
this vector right here and this vector right here and solving exactly the same way. Well, I'm going to have 2 and 3 from vector A, 4 and 6 from vector B, 0, 0 once again. And if I do this and I try to solve to bring this into reduced row echelon form, I will end up with 1, 2, 0, and across the bottom I will have all zeros. And if you remember from what we talked about in a previous tutorial, that means we have many solutions, which makes sense because these are lines that lie literally on top of each other, and we also know that these are not independent. Okay, so I know I hit you with a lot of jargon today, but this kind of, that's what we have to do. We have to really get these concepts into our brains and understand this basic jargon before we can then go forward and start doing some really cool stuff. So hopefully you understand that. And like always, please leave your questions and comments down below. Otherwise, till next time.